are available, make sure you hit the enable button in Zoom. Please hold your questions until the end. We'll have plenty of time for questions, but when we get to that time, if you want to type your question in the chat, we'll be moderating from the chat, or you can use the raise hand function and we will call on you um, in the order that you all raise your hand. Um, so we'll get started with our presentation and then we'll do questions at the end. So I'm just going to share my screen. So bear with me one second. And all right, here we are. So inclusive you. So Inclusive U is part of the Tayshoff Center, and we are under the School of Education at Syracuse University. So Inclusive U is one of the really important initiatives of the Tayshoff Center, and we're committed to increasing opportunities to college for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We are really proud of the program we built, and we always like to start our info session giving you a visual and letting you see what our program is. So we're going to start off with our video um, and then we'll continue on with giving you more information about the pieces of our program. One second. Hey, Carly, do you mind sharing your screen? Yep, I got it. Every student deserves the opportunity to have the college experience to help them achieve their dreams. Inclusive U is an opportunity for students with intellectual disability to have a full college experience. So students earn a meaningful certificate from Syracuse University. Students declare a major. They participate in fully inclusive coursework. They can participate in college internships in real business opportunities. Students can participate in clubs and organizations. Students can live in residence halls. Our students have lots of peer opportunities and participate in attending athletic events. My favorite things about SU was like just, I mean, everything was my favorite, like being able to be with my friends, doing like all these opportunities that I didn't think I was gonna do. I love SU because it's fun, especially my favorite mascot, Otto. Otto. Harry Dyer, you 2020, go cute. let's go our house. I think the first time I met Harry was when he came in for orientation. He was a student who, just getting from one room to another, could easily get lost or confused. Harry became this student over four years who lived independently in the dorms. He became this student who could navigate campus on his own. When he walks across campus, he knows everyone. He is just a star. This little kid, we love basketball a lot. Harry started working with the men's basketball team as one of the student managers. Harry has always had this love of sports and athletics and it fit right in with his career goals and also with his major. It was something that was really just a, a dream come true for him. Basketball manager. And coming out suddenly, my boys are awesome. And then his senior year, Harry participated in our senior internships. We know that for many of our students, getting a job after graduation is a really important goal for them. And it's an important goal for most college students. The internship year is something that we think is a really important part of our Inclusive U programming, that we help support students in choosing something that is tied to their career interests 
and is related to their major. All of these pieces really tie together for a student like Harry because he took courses in his major area of study and so his major was exercise science. He worked with the men's basketball team throughout his college career and he also did his internships in both the Barn Center and the Manly Fieldhouse. So those internships really tied into what his career goals are. Often our students go to classes with a peer mentor that can help them with their schoolwork, who can help them organize their materials, help them participate in class, help them participate in group work, help them with their homework. Students can bring a mentor or students can work with us to hire an SU student to be a peer mentor. We set up from the very beginning a peer-to-peer -peer program. It's really expanded the social opportunities for students and really given them that extra first step in how to get involved. We're really proud of our program and how much it's grown in the last few years. Three years ago, we had our first student who lived in the residence hall, and that was Megan. When I started as a freshman at Inclusive View, I was very shy, and I didn't really know anybody. I was the first person to live in the dorms. We work with the Inclusive View students to figure out what kinds of supports they might need. Residential mentors are SU students who live in the residence halls and get matched up with our students based on their needs. It was just really hard for me because like, I, didn't, I guess I, I wasn't used to like living away from home, but then I got really used to it after a while and I stayed in the dorm and I met a lot of nice people and everything who like let me like be who I am. Harry lived downstairs too so we all hung out together all the time. To see her graduating from Syracuse University and about to move into her own apartment I'm just really proud. Cleo was our first Remembrance Scholar from Inclusive View. The Remembrance Scholarship is, is the highest honor at Syracuse University. And to have a Remembrance Scholar as an Inclusive U student is something that we actually didn't know could ever happen. I'm really proud to be part of Syracuse University because of their inclusive stance. It makes me feel good because they know I've been supporting this college community here at Syracuse University because they know I've been attending every event. My student organization, Campus Involvement, I was part of was Relay for Life. I was a recruitment chair. My sophomore year, I joined Sport Management Club, a like student association I'm also part of. I liked it so I could like show my leadership. No dream is too big just because somebody told you that you couldn't do these things or just because you were nervous or scared doesn't mean that you can't go out and do these big things in your life because these three prove that it's possible and you can do it too. This is a college campus where students with disabilities are really part of the full college experience. I'll say I change because I'm, I'm a grow up person. You can do anything that you want to do. I love figures. This is my life right now. So before we move on and I reshare my screen, I want to make sure that you know who are the staff on this call. Um, so I'll introduce myself and then I will let each of our staff members introduce themselves. So I'm Brianna Schultz. I'm the director of Inclusive U. I've been here for about seven and a half years um, and I oversee all of the day-to-day -day happenings within Inclusive U. So Sam, I'll toss it to you. I'm Sam Rue. I'm the academic coordinator at Inclusive U. Um, I've been with Inclusive U since before it was even Inclusive U back in 2013. And it's been amazing to see how it's grown over the years. Uh, Jen? Hi, I'm Jen Quinn. I'm the internship and employment coordinator at Inclusive U. I've uh, been officially with SU for about a year and a half, but with the program for almost four years. 
Hi, I'm Bridget Fowler. I am the residential coordinator, and I've been with Inclusive U about a year and a half now. I'm going to pass it to Carly. Hi, I'm Carly Grafasi. I am the operations and communications director over here at Inclusive U. I send out those emails reminding you to show up to info sessions like this one. And I've been here seven years. Awesome. Wonderful. So our staff is really awesome. I'm super thankful for each of them. Um, so I will reshare our PowerPoint and then Sam, you can take it away. Great. And, and we are sorry that that video was a little bit more of a slideshow than a video. Um, it was working really well earlier today when we tested it, but something's going on with Zoom right now. But if you want to watch it again, it is available on our YouTube. Uh, if you just type in inclusive view, you should be able to find the video pretty easy. Okay, so we're just going to do a overview of some of the most important aspects of the program. Um, and then at the end, you'll see our last two pieces of internship and inclusive, inclusive housing. We have dedicated slides to them. So I will pass it over to Bree and then to Bridget to handle those two pieces. So let's start with academic coursework. We, we all know that, well, there are other maybe more exciting and fun reasons why people go to college. One of the most important parts of going to college is academics, is um, getting something out of the classroom. Um, the most important thing to note for Inclusive U is there are no separate or segregated classrooms for our Inclusive U students. The classes they take are standard Syracuse University classes. Um, our students pretty much have free reign to choose the type of classes they want to take and the area of study that they want to study. We, we basically have students in every single school across Syracuse University's campus. We have students here in the School of Education working on um, degrees in either early uh, childhood ed or adolescent education. We have folks over in Falk College that are um, working in different things such as exercise science or sports management. We have people in the School of Art doing uh, drama or, um, you know, kind of painting in that style of art. We have students all over this campus. Um, and they're all working towards a university certificate. So a vast majority of our students are auditing their classes. And what that basically means is, is that they are taking the credit, uh, they're, rather they're taking the class, but they are not taking it for an official college credit. Instead, they are auditing that class and that gives us the opportunity to make modifications to the coursework. For a lot of our students um, taking a college level class and having the exact same rigors and expectations of the standard credit bearing class is, is a bit too challenging. And so a lot of our students are auditing so we can make modifications to the coursework. Um, examples of modifications might be changing a five page paper to a one page paper or changing it entirely from a paper to a PowerPoint or maybe a short uh, presentation that's given during the professor's office hours. Um, it might be completely eliminating certain aspects of the class. Maybe they're attending, they're doing the reading, but they're not doing quizzes or tests. Um, it can also alter perhaps the way they're participating in class. Maybe they want to listen, but they don't want to be called on unless they raise their hand. These are all kinds of modifications that we can create to make the classroom accessible for the student um, and challenging for the student without overwhelming them. We're always trying to strike that balance. And so the modifications that students make are entirely, um, entirely changeable and malleable throughout the semester. Um, so if you find that a modification isn't working, either because it's the thing that you're working on is still too challenging, or maybe it's way too easy and you kind of like underestimated what you could do, we can always go back and make those changes. Um, it's important to note that these modifications are done um, as a collaborative effort between the Inclusive View student, um, us as support staff for the students, 
as well as the, the families that are involved. Um, so we really work together and collaborate to try to make these modifications work for our students. Um, our students do have the ability to take classes for, I get this question a lot, so I just wanna answer it right away. Our students do have the ability to take classes for credit if they so choose, but it's important to note that a student taking a college class for credit, there's not really much that we can do in line with modifications for the class. So it would be expected that they do everything that any other student in the class is doing in terms of assignments and you know attendance policies and all that kind of stuff. But it is definitely a possibility if you are considering that. Um, in terms of the support that's provided for students, um, a lot of our students are receiving support either via their Medicaid budget if they're in New York State or directly from inclusive you are them directly from inclusive you ourselves. Um, so we have students that are from New York State that are using their self-direction budget to hire uh, community hab staff to come to campus with them and to go to class with them and to help them out outside of class and attend social events. And so we have some students that are either bringing their own support with them from home. Maybe it's someone who they have self-hired to do other things in the community with. And then we also have a community partner agency called the Coverman Center that we work with that um, specifically hires mainly Syracuse University students to provide that similar support. Someone to um, hang out with on campus, someone to go to class with, things of that nature. Um, if you are not from in-state and are still interested in that type of support, uh, Inclusive U also hires SU students and a couple of professional staff as well to do a similar type of support directly through Inclusive U. So there are multiple different ways that you can receive that support to be successful on campus. Um, we also have a, a built-in layer of support for the folks that are living on campus and living in the residence halls, but I'll save that support for the housing slide that Bridget will go over with it. Um, in addition to the more, uh, you know, kind of academic centric support, we also do try to build in a lot of social opportunity for our students. One big piece of the social opportunity that we build in is the peer to peer system that we've created. And so basically, I kind of view it as this um, platonic match.com kind of thing, right? You fill out this profile about yourself, what you like to do, what your interests are, what's your schedule for the semester. And so our inclusive youth students do that, but also any other Syracuse University student that's interested does this as well. Um, and so basically we look at all these different students that have applied and we try to match people together based on like schedules and also like interests, but it becomes a really cool way for a, both inclusive you and non-inclusive you SU students to be able to spend time together and just hang out, right? This isn't, I view it as less of a support system and more of like a, it's more of a peer-based system. We don't expect that, um, you know, it's kind of a mentor mentee kind of thing. It's more like two college students hanging out and spending some time together. Um, and a really great thing about it is it really does expose our students to a whole host of things they might have not gotten themselves into. Maybe this student is a junior and they've been going to this club and then they bring the inclusive youth student to the club with them. Those are all really cool um, things that we've seen happen as a part of that programming. Uh, we also hire a few SU and inclusive youth students to be what we call peer trainers. And so these are students that we kind of put into a little bit more of a leadership role to help kind of curate the really cool things that are going on campus. Every weekend, there's something really fun to do almost every night, but especially during the weekends at the university. And so what our students do that are peer trainers is they look into all these different things and they basically come up with a schedule of here's the cool things that we're going to go to as like the peer to peer group. And um, we have a coordinator that sends out a, basically like a newsletter of those events each week. And so it's a really cool way for our students to have set up things throughout the week that they know if they go to, 
they're going to see some students they know, they're going to have some support kind of built into it, and they know they're going to have that group environment to, to fall back on. They don't feel like they've got to go out and, you know, figure out all this stuff on their own. Um, so that's a really awesome way that we keep our students um, active, involved, and, and social throughout the week. It is important to know with all this stuff, you know, especially with peer-to-peer -peer and with clubs and activities like I'll talk about later, it is the student's choice. You know, we don't push a student to do any sort of club activity event that they don't want to do. A big part of this type of program is advocacy. You know, you as a student, you have to advocate. You have to want it. Um, and you have to go for it right? It's the same thing with the clubs and student activities. Our students have the same access to clubs and orgs that any other SU student has access to, but you got to go out and do it, right? We're here to help. If you say, hey, I'm interested in bowling, is there anything going on on campus that's in that field? We'd be happy to help you do some research there. I'm happy to help you get connected, but you know, the actual go out and do it, that's something that you've got to have the the desire to do. But we've seen students in tons of different clubs all throughout campus. We've seen students on the curling team. We've seen students do Orange Pulse, which is the dance troupe at the university. We've seen students in acting clubs. Um, and we've even seen students take leadership positions in these clubs. We have a couple of students right now that are on executive boards for different clubs on campus. So there really is a whole host of opportunity out there if you're willing to go out and take it. Um, we, we even started just this past fall, uh, a Special Olympics Unified Sports Chapter opened up here at SU. So that's another really cool way that we see students getting involved and staying active. Um, they practice each week, hopefully next month. I actually just got a message from the president of that club a, a minute ago. They're they're gearing up to do a series of games later in April. So we're really excited to see what happens there. Okay, great. Uh, Bree, anything you feel like I missed there that's worth going back to? No, nope, I think you covered it all. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Let's turn it over to, uh, to Bree for internships. Awesome. So Sam talked about the academics piece, which is a really important piece of a student's time here at Syracuse. But we have found what's also equally important is a student's internship year. So a typical track for students in inclusive U is three years of classes and then spending their last final year in an internship or two semester long internships, um, really focusing on preparing to graduate and go find a job after college. Um, so what we've created is our internship program. And we really tried to think about this individually for students because we know students do not all have the same employment goals or plan when they leave college. Um, so what students do in their final year is they take two semester long internships working about 20 hours per week. And we pair this with a morning employment skills class to really give students background on communicating with coworkers, building their resume, talking about networking, practicing interview skills, this curriculum really touches on a lot of those pieces that are so critical in finding and keeping a job. Um, and then students go to their internship site and practice these skills in real time. Um, each internship site is individualized for the student. So while we may have one student access um, childcare one semester and a different student access childcare another semester, we're really thinking about the student and their strengths and areas that they need to work on. And the two sites may look a little different. Students might be working on different things or their daily task list might be a little different. So students are getting exactly what they need out of our internship program. Um, students are supported on their internship sites, either by job coaches through Access VR, which is vocational rehab, or some students choose to hire their own support and bring them with them to support them on the job sites. We're really focusing on transferable job skills, 
skills that students can take with them and apply to many jobs within their time of employment. Um, we really work with students to define their career goal and think about things that might be enjoyable for them, things that they don't want to do. We spend a lot of time in the internship here talking about environment. Um, do you like things that are too loud or is working in a place with lots of people not desirable? We really want students to be able to decide what they like and self-advocate for the things that they need. Um, students also in their senior year have access to our business engagement group. And it's a group of local employers who mentor and advocate for our students in the community. And they're also really key pieces in helping to build networks for student as they transition out and graduate. Um, we really take into consideration the student's certificate that they earn here and make sure that their internship is tied to that um, certificate as well. So students are gaining practical work skills in the area of study that they're interested in to match that with their career goal. Um, our internship year is really important to students because like many matriculated students, this gives them the opportunity to practice and make mistakes before they move out into the real world and are working and um, really experiencing what this is like um, in real time. We have about 40 internship sites on campus right now, but this list is ever evolving and changing. Um, students intern in anywhere from the mailroom to um, our food service and dining hall to childcare to parking and transit services. There's a lot of internship on campus, but um, this is constantly evolving as our students are majoring in different things and expressing different areas and expressing different career goals um, that they would like to meet. So this is something that is always changing and we're really relying on student input and um, desires to create the internship they want. I'm going to pass it to Bridget to talk about housing. Yay, housing. <clears throat> okay. This is such a fun part of the college experience. We go to college to take classes and learn the academic side of things. But it's also important to have the experience of learning to live in a dorm, learning to share space, learning to share um, amenities and bathrooms and, and all of the, the fun pieces that are part of it. In our housing program, we have students living in, in dorms across campus. Um, these are just like any other student that comes to the university. Uh, we separate our students um, across campus so that they have the opportunity to um, meet a wide variety of um, their peers. What this looks like is we might have a few students on each floor of different dorms. So Inclusive View doesn't have one dorm all to itself or one area on campus. It's really spread out in order to give a full experience. Um, this also gives chance for Inclusive View students to visit each other across campus and learn about different dorms and different dining halls. Um, when they live on campus, when our students live on campus, they have the option of um, being part of a residential mentor program. A residential mentor program are matriculated students that have shown success with living on campus, and they're going to be neighbors of the inclusive youth students. And their job is to, one, help and make sure that there's a healthy, happy learning environment. And then, two, it helps to um, make sure that the students are socializing and accessing the different um, opportunities for that, whether that's in trend, like whether that's just like natural things that are happening on campus and attending, or whether it's taking the effort to send a text message to a friend, inviting them to dinner and following through with that process. The residential mentors are there to help guide and be the liaison on campus. Um, our students will go to them for first uh, questions that they have about maybe how do they use the laundry room or where is the library? And they will do this uh, to help them navigate the different pieces. Our residential mentors will not do hands-on um, care for the student, but more so coaching or observing what they're seeing in the environment to help the students 
kind of define what's important to them and reach the goals that they have determined as necessary. Um, I think that's a good overview of our housing and the residential mentor team and uh, the great opportunities for living on campus. Great. So a day in the life. Um, we just wanted to throw this slide in here to give you a little glimpse of what it might look like as your, as your typical day as an inclusive youth student. And so in the morning, maybe you meet up with your peer partner um, for breakfast or coffee, and then maybe hit the gym with them. Um, then you might meet your mentor and attend class, have some time for studying and homework grab lunch at Varsity or at one of the dining halls with your friends, um, attend a seminar. And this is actually something that I didn't talk about earlier. Um, seminars are a really cool opportunity for our students to meet up and explore um, different kinds of topics based on like and common interests that we find. Um, and so we host seminars on a variety of topics I host one at the gym to give students the opportunity to all meet up and work out with some personal trainers each week. Um, Bridget hosts one for the residential students where they talk about kind of like interpersonal skills and how to navigate living on campus and things of that nature. Um, we host, Jen hosts one on, you know, starting to talk about career interests and things regarding um, what your employment opportunities or interests might be um, once you're, you know, getting closer to graduating. Um, we host one that uh, operates as kind of like a um, sexual education and healthy relationships curriculum. Um, these are all really awesome opportunities for students to meet throughout the week and, you um, you know, deep dive into some topics that they really have a lot of interest in, in learning more about, but aren't things that are typically in your standard Syracuse University curriculum. Um, so that that's another thing that we find our students doing, you know, at least one of per day, if they're here all day. Um, a student might then go to the library or computer lab. They might go participate in a club or organization and then dinner with friends. And then I had mentioned the really fun things that students do uh, especially over the weekends. Orange After Dark is a big contributor of that. Our students are typically going to Orange After Dark events basically every weekend. And these are events that are hosted by Syracuse University and are typically highly subsidized, you know, typically less than $5 admission. And sometimes there are events on campus, maybe it's a bingo night or maybe it's a uh, Pinterest party or something like that, but they also do events on campus. They've gone to mini golf courses and escape rooms and water parks and things like that. And basically they're just really fun ways for students to get involved with social life on campus without it being all about just going to some random house and drinking. Um, so it's a, a really cool way that a lot of students stay involved on the, especially on the weekends with each other. Yeah, and Carly just posted in the chat here the current seminars that we offer this semester, uh, just as a, a way to get a better idea of the different kinds of topics that we um, that we go over in seminars. And there's so much to do here. This is just a sample. Students tend to be either more involved or start off very slowly. So it's really up to the student. The student has a lot of choice in how they build their day. Um, so we wanted to talk about different paths to inclusive you. There's lots of different ways to pay for your experience here. Um, the biggest way that people pay for classes and um, other things here is using their OPWDD or Medicaid self-direction budget. Um, we have are able to put money in the community classes line in the transition line so students can access those funds to pay for their time here. Um, some students come in through our on-campus partnership with the Syracuse City School District. This is a really small partnership of about 12 students um, but very meaningful to all of us and it gives students in their last few years of high school the opportunity to come up to campus to experience college life, take classes, 
um, attend activities, do everything that an inclusive youth student does during their final years of high school. Um, so that is a partnership and a piece that students would need to apply to separately. Um, and that is, if you're a Syracuse City School District student, feel free to reach out to us for more information on that partnership. Um, we also have students who are um, children of parents who work here at the university, and they are able to use their dependent benefit to fund some of their classes and time here. Um, and then we have students who pay out of pocket um, for the various things here on campus. We are also a comprehensive transition program, so students can fill out the FAFSA, select Syracuse University as their institution or their school, and our financial aid office will put together a financial aid package based on the outcome of the FAFSA. Um, our financial aid office at the College of Professional Studies is wonderful at working individually with students and families to figure out funding and um, during the student's time here at the university. So um, they're a really important resource during your time here. And then the next piece, applying to inclusive you, probably the most important part. Um, so our application for the fall of 2023 is currently closed. Um, our next application for the fall of 2024 will open sometime around July 15th. Our application will close on January 15th of 2024. Um, our application is online on our website. You can click the link, create an account, and then upload and load your information in that way. Um, we have our application asks some of the common questions that you find on a college application. Um, we ask about different skills that you may have. We want to get to know you during this process. Um, so our online application is one of those pieces. We also ask for recommendation letters. We do ask for some documentation, such as your IEP or your psychological evaluation. Um, and then once our application closes, we'll contact you for a few more pieces of information because we do want to get to know you in other ways. We understand that filling out an online application is not always the best representation of somebody. So we will give you the opportunity to share either a piece of creative work that you've done, a video of you doing something that's really meaningful or important to you, or some other creative project to show us who you are. We also couple that with an interview either done on Zoom or in person so that we can talk and we can understand why you're motivated to come to college, what is driving you to Syracuse University, and why this experience is so important to you. Um, we use all of these pieces of information because we want to make sure that Syracuse University is the best fit for the students who are applying, but also so that we know and understand you as you're transitioning from high school to college or from whatever part of your life to college. Um, this process lasts until about mid-March um, is when we send out our acceptances. So um, we try and follow the same timeline as the traditional Syracuse University timeline, um, but we do this whole process in-house. Um, our admissions committee is made up of our leadership staff here at Inclusive U. So the people who you're interviewing with are the same people that you will be interacting with when you come to college here. Um, we think that's a really important piece so that throughout this process, you also get to know us and who we are here at the university. So with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we are going to open it up for questions. So just a reminder, please load your questions in the chat or use the raise hand function so we can um, call on you in the order that you raise your hand. All right, so the first question that we pulled from the chat, if an individual is medically fragile and needs a nurse, would this be a possible program for them? Um, we've had, had students use, 
I guess we would also need to know the context of this. We have had students who have used an extra support while they're on campus. Um, this would definitely be an important piece about planning for a student's time here at the university. And our staff would talk with the student and their support network through the application process to make sure we're appropri appropriately planning for support um, and the needs of the student. Bridget, this question's for you. Um, for students living in dorms, what are the room options? For example, do they have their own rooms or do they share a room with other inclusive youth students or do they share with other SU students? Yeah, great question. So we have our students that kind of make up all of the different categories. Most of our students choose to share a room with another inclusive youth student so that they can balance having friends that are in a similar program, in addition to making friends with neighbors that might be matriculated students. We also have students who are in single rooms, and then we have some students who share rooms with matriculated students. So we really will do a, a combination of what works best for the student, the students need, and the experience that they're looking for on campus. Um, yeah. Right. And I think I read another question that was, can students have cars on campus? And the answer is yes, but it's typically going to be after their freshman year. And our students will go through the same exact process that any student would go through, um, contacting parking, looking at the options, and um, paying for what that fee would be. All right, the next question is, what are the accommodations for physical disabilities on campus? Um, we work closely with our Center on Disability Resources to accommodate students for all of their needs. So we would work with the student to make sure that anything that they needed, um, they received during their time on campus and that if these needs change, then those accommodations change as well. Um, so again, this is a really individualized process where we would work with the student and the Center on Disability Resources to make sure um, everything is addressed. Sam, would you like to take the next one? <clears throat> yeah, so there's a question about um, crediting accredited classes versus auditing classes. And I'll just go into the general of that a little bit more. So as a student who's taking a class for credit, no, you don't have access to modifications like the ones that I had mentioned earlier, but you certainly do have access to accommodations. So accommodations are things that you might've had written into your IEP, like extended time on tests or someone to take notes for you or a, a copy of any sort of thing that's on the board put in front of you, all those kinds of things that are about the way that you access the class, you can get those regardless of whether you are credited or whether you're taking class for credit or auditing it. The additional modifications, those things where you're actually changing the expectations of the class, those are things just for the students that are auditing. So yeah, so your accommodations, you've got access stuff. You've got things that can help make the class more accessible for you. Modifications are when we're actually changing what's expected of you. And the modifications are just for students who are auditing. I also saw, uh, if you don't mind me taking this, I also saw some questions about like demographic type stuff. How many students do we take? Admissions types things. So I'd just like to answer those. We take in around 25 to 30 students each year. Um, and we only do our admissions in the fall semester. So we're not admitting any students in for the spring semester. The reasoning for that is we think that it's really important for our students to really be coming into this process in a cohort. It's really important for you to know that when you're joining Inclusive U, that you have another 25 to 30 students that are also going through this crazy transition that is college along with you. We also have a three-day orientation, well, a two-day orientation for our commuter students and a three-day orientation for our residential students as a part of your fall admission. So we really think it's important for everyone to be on the same page with that. And that's why we only do admits in the uh, fall, for the fall semester each year. Great, thank you. And um, yes, we have a total of just over 100 students right now. Great. Um, and speaking of admissions, 
uh, criteria for our admissions. Um, what we are really looking for in a student is motivation to go to college. Why do you want to go to college? What is Why is this the logical next step? And how are you prepared for this? Um, we Our interview process and our application process has lots of different parts because we want to make sure that we draw out the most information for students. Um, it's important to note that residentially, we are not a 24-7 program. Um, students should be able to manage their downtime, take medication independently, um, be able to navigate and get to different places on campus independently. We really want to make sure that students are set up for success um, before coming here as well. I can take um, the next question about campus safety and tolerance. Our students are expected to follow the same code of conduct that the rest of the university follows. So that's an expectation we have across the board. And one of our driving mottos or something we like to talk about is dignity of risk. So our students really have the opportunity to take the same risks that a typical college student would experience. Um, and we like to do this under the umbrella of support and mentors and peers in order to explore college life and um, learn through the natural consequences of what that might look like. In addition to the safety question, we do have a really great relationship with our university to police mm -hmm. department. There are lots of resources to get involved with the police department. And we have an on-call service for the residential folks if there's a situation that a student's trying to navigate just so that they have somebody in their corner to help listen and communicate with them. And so uh, I think that covers most of the safety and tolerance portions of the university, but that's something to keep in mind is that our students would need to be able to follow the same um, code of conduct that has the same conduct, the, excuse me, the same consequences that anybody would have at the university. Great, thank you, Bridget. I'm going to jump back to admissions because I'm seeing a lot of questions pop in the chat. Um, typically students start between the ages of 18 to 21 or older. Um, it really is up to the student on when they feel ready for college. Um, we do have a lot of students who start between 18 and 21, but then we do have many students who start uh, here at Syracuse in their late 20s, um, in their 30s, and some even in their 40s. So we're not a program that puts an age limit on this because we feel when a student is ready for college, that can be at any time. Um, I also saw if we have any, um, hold on one second, diagnoses or requirements for admissions. One thing you'll notice on our application is we do not have a certain criteria for a degree. We do not have a certain reading level a student needs to meet. We recognize that students have many barriers in accessing college. So we have tried to make sure that this application is open for everybody. Um, so we're not looking for a certain diploma, reading level, or skill level as students are applying to our program. Yeah, I think the really the most important things that we're looking for are motivation. Um, does, does the student who's applying really seem like they want this experience? Um, and do we feel like they are ready for that experience? Um, as we're talking to them? Do we feel like this is something that they could be successful in and make the most of? Um, so that's a really important piece of this, of the whole puzzle is that, and that's really what we're looking at. I would also say that we, um, we really wanna make sure that for our residential students, that they do have the ability to be um, independent and safe in an environment. Like Bree said, this isn't, a program where you're going to have someone with you 24 seven students do need to have some independent living skills and be successful and being able to navigate on their own and things like that if they are living on campus. Um, for our students that commute that's we're, we're not as concerned about those kinds of things, but for our students who are living on campus, we do want to make sure that they can be safe and successful here. Great, thank you. Um, can you do OPWDD funding and financial aid? Yes. Many students braid their funding or the ways that they pay for college. So um, again, this is something the financial aid office is really experienced in working through. So um, 
if you're offered admission here, that would be a first step in contacting them. Um, Bridget, this next one is for you. Yeah, so Great. this one's asking how do families and residents and residential mentors communicate in, when they're living residentially? And the way that works is typically we like most communication to come directly from the student in the program. And so we really want to encourage our students to tell their families how's it going, what's new, what their challenges are, um, where that, you know, just kind of give the standard update. We encourage our students to reach out to their parents. Um, in cases where we're noticing a change of behavior or noticing something um, that we think parents need to be aware of, we will notify you and let you know and, and have communication with you. And then if you get kind of one of those spidey senses that parents get from time to time about their students that you want to check in and something doesn't feel quite right, you're always welcome to reach out to us and we can do kind of a check-in. But we don't have like a typical... Um, formal process in giving updates to families, but we do a pretty good job of, of staying in the loop and staying in the loop with the students and the families. I think the next part of the question was, what is the difference between residential mentors, peer mentors, and um, peer to peers? So I think Sam was saying a peer to peer is just a hangout person, somebody that's at the university that wants to hang out with our folks. Um, and there's academic mentors, sometimes called student support assistants. These are the folks that are going to class with students, maybe helping them with an assignment, and it's more of an academic focus. And then we have the residential mentors, and these are students who are living in the residence, and they have a neighbor that's a residential mentor that will help work with them a few hours each week to um, make sure things are going as planned, to check in on their environment, um, make sure they know how to use the laundry machines and help with any social challenges that they may be having or social successes that they may be having within the dorm community. Great, Bridget, I think the next one is for you as well. Uh, do okay. residential students stay on campus during the weekends? We have a combination of both. So we have residential students who maybe started their first year as commuter, and then the next year they wanted to live residentially, but part of that meant that they wanted to go home every weekend. And then in their third year, they're staying on campus throughout the, um, the weekends. And we even have students who chose to stay on campus through spring break because they really enjoyed the independence and autonomy that they've developed. So whatever the student feels is gonna be their best pathway is really what we support. So if a student wants to stay over the weekend, wonderful. Lots of events and things happening on campus, but you do have to be in charge of your time um, and be able to fill that time appropriately. And then, um, but if you wanna go home for the weekends because that feels good, let's do that too. Great, thank you. Um, we have two more questions about admissions, and both are asking about certain criteria for admissions. So um, while we look at the documentation that you send us and the diploma that the student earns, what we're really looking for, again, is that motivation and fit. Um, we're not requiring a certain diploma. We're not requiring a certain IQ. This is just information to help us learn about the student and understand their experience in school prior to coming to college. Um, so again, these are just resource documents that we use to help understand the student. So your past experience in high school um, helps to uh, tell your story, and we're using that throughout our application process. So again, we don't have a criteria for IQ or diagnosed, uh, sorry, for diploma. Any additional questions? Is anybody brave enough to raise their hand and ask a question? I see a question from Cassie here regarding navigating on campus. Um, honestly, there is a university app that has a map on it, but it's not as good as the um, tried and true Google Maps. So Google Maps is the application that we recommend anyone who's interested in coming to Syracuse University to start learning how to use it now. Start learning how to use navigation 
on your Google Maps app now, um, because that is the easiest way to get around campus. It's just you open up Google Maps, you type in the place you need to go, you click walking directions, and it shows you exactly how to get there. But if you're trying it for your first time here at SU, it's going to be overwhelming. So it's definitely something that we recommend practicing at home ahead of time. Great. I see iPhone. I'm sorry, your name's not there. Um, go ahead. Oh, is that me? Yes, that's, that's you. you. Oh, my name's Aaron. I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't realize Hi, the name's not in there. But uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank you all. Your presentation was great. And uh, honestly, you know, as a parent of a special needs, child you know it's just so heartwarming to hear you all, all of you speak it's, it's a such a great program you have um we're in the boston area and i uh, just a couple of uh, questions one is you mentioned the internships are mainly targeted for year four but i was wondering if you have vocational training internships you know available during the first three years as well jen do you want to take that sure um while we don't regularly offer them during the first three years, it is something that is possible and we have done. The internship program is ever evolving and it's really student driven. Um, so if it's something, you know, we have students who successfully have worked out in the community prior to coming, um, you know, and we feel like they can handle the academic load along with some internship. Um, then that's certainly something that we have done. So it's a possibility, just not something we do or guarantee for everyone. Yeah, I just sure. want to reiterate that the transition to college is a lot. I don't care how confident you are, it's tough and there's a lot to learn. And that's why we typically wouldn't recommend an internship placement for a first year student, because there's already so much they have to learn in this transition. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to add that piece that it's it's not because we don't want to. It's because it's already a ton of for the student to be learning um, for that first year. So we try to chunk it in that way. Right. Uh, OK, that makes sense. Thanks. Um, I I know you in the chat. I, I can't really read the chats right now, but I know that you meant you were answering a question about tours. But um, for a campus tour, like say this spring, you know, for potentially next fall admission or something. Um, it, is that just through the straight admissions office or are you guys available for part of that experience as well? So our campus tour is offered through the admissions office. They do a really wonderful job, um, including prospective students of Inclusive U into that tour. Um, okay. If you do schedule a tour on campus, please reach out to us and let us know. Um, yeah. And then if one of our staff members is available, we could answer some questions shortly after your tour. Okay. And um, just my my last question is, um, do, do all the inclusive use students, or let's say almost all, spend four years in the program? Most students do spend four years. Um, we have some students who have been real go-getters and in three years, they're ready to do their internship and um, graduate, but most students spend four years here on campus. Okay, sounds amazing. <laughs> awesome, thanks for your questions. We have another one in the chat. Uh, Sandy's. Um, Casey says, oh, Sandy's yes. If you want to answer that, Sam, I'm not sure if you know. Um, so Sandy, there isn't a dedicated program to animal science, unfortunately. We do have some classes that cover um, biology and we have a couple classes that are related to animals, but nothing very formal, you know, no sort of veterinarian kind of track or anything like that. That's That's definitely, an area of interest that we wish uh, was further explored here at SU, but it just hasn't been to this point. Um, I also see from um, from Cassie, oh yeah, there is a pet therapy room. Um, and so a few times a week, uh, the university over at our gym brings in some animals for students that might be missing their pets at home to come in and just hang out with a Labradoodle and relax and have a good time. 
Um, so that's a, a really cool way to kind of stay connected with um, if you're missing your pet or anything like that. Um, I also see, can students pledge a sorority fraternity? Um, and are many involved in Greek life? I would not say that many are involved. Um, there's a little bit of red tape at the national level with sororities and fraternities uh, regarding the fact that our students are not um, matriculated SU students, you know, because they're most of them are not going for a bachelor's degree. But we have seen some students get involved in some of the professional fraternities and sororities that happen on on campus and throughout the country. So we have a student right now that's involved in like the um, professional filmmakers fraternity. I can't remember the exact name off the top of my head, um, but we have had some students get involved in those kind of like service and professional frets and sororities. Um, I'll answer Courtney's question really quick and then Sue B, I will let you unmute. Um, Courtney, I would recommend um, referring to our website and our cost page all of the costs that we have kind of laid out over this presentation are written there very clearly. So you can see what Medicaid self-direction would cover and what would be an out-of-pocket cost. Um, so maybe Carly or Sam could toss the link to the cost page in the chat. Um, Thank so you. Go ahead, you're welcome. Hi, Sue. Hi, I've got a couple of questions. Sure. Um, I came on here thinking, you know, my son would be able to you know, apply and, and get in and it was um, more open than just getting 25 to 30 people per year. That seems very discouraging. Um, what is your percentage of applicants to actual ones that get in? This is the toughest part of our job. Um, while we would love to offer everybody a spot, right now with our current model, our capacity is about 25 to 30 students per class. Um, so we have about a 50% acceptance rate. We take about half the students that apply. Um, I would also think college.net has a really wonderful resource of other college programs. Um, but I know that our program is also very competitive. There are 312 um, inclusive higher ed programs across the, across the country, and we know that's not enough. Um, but I would definitely refer to Think College. Um, there's other programs in New York State. I'm sorry, this is discouraging, but we really do our best to find students who are a great fit. Um, but we also know that a lot of students wish to come here and it's the hardest part of our job is our admissions process. Okay, let, let's just move on and see, say that whoever applies got in. What's the typical course load um, per semester, but also what's the certificate? That's what they earn at the end, correct? What's the requirements for that? Students take between two and three courses each semester. Um, Sam, do you want to speak a little bit more on this? Yeah, um, so our students, like Bree said, take two to three, um, you know, main campus academic classes per semester. Um, there are three credits each, and the students are auditing those, those classes. Um, and so most students are doing two to three of those. And then if they want to do like an extra uh, phys ed class or something like that on top of it, some of our students who really want to stay busy will also include a class or two like that. So I also see a question about like how many hours for classes and seminars. I would say your class hours in class hours are typically going to be around eight to 10 class hours per week. And then you're probably going to spend around the same amount of time each week working on the stuff outside of class. Uh, it's typically um, the idea is, is that you know, the amount of time that you're spending in class, you should spend outside of class working on the classwork as well. Um, and then seminars, our students can sign up for as many or as little as they want. We have some students that are doing eight a week, others that are doing none. Each of those seminars is about 50 minutes once a week. So you can kind of do the math there. Um, uh, and then, um, I'm sorry, what was the second part of that question? Or did I answer it? 
<laughs> no, you didn't. Um, certificate requirements. Yeah. So uh, it's so basically, like I said at the beginning, you can get a certificate in the area of study that you want. So our certificates are all modeled on the pre-existing majors and minors that SU offers. And you need to take five classes in that major or minor in order to be eligible for the certificate. So if you're taking two to three classes a semester, you have a lot of room for uh, electives outside of that. You only have to take five classes in your area of study to get that certificate. So you've got plenty of time to explore, to take electives, to really figure out what you want. You don't have to come in year one knowing exactly what you want your major to be. We build in time for you to have more than enough time to take classes in a few different area studies to narrow down what you want to do here at SU. Okay. okay. Can I ask for some clarification? Because I was hearing that it, a typical student, it's a four-year program, one of them being an internship. So you've had three years of classes pretty much. And within those three years, you have taken five classes and one major component so you can get that certificate? Is yes. that how you can possibly graduate earlier or whatever um, the, the term is, but um, you can finish that in three years if you were focusing on just those five primary classes and getting those out of the way in two years rather than three years? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Um, Stephanie, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I just had a question about physical disabilities. Um, my son has um, a mild physical disability. He uses a crutch um, to navigate. Um, how accessible is the campus um, itself? I, my sister went to Syracuse and she's um, with her daughter to visit, and she said there's a lot of steep hills or kind of physically like yeah, how it's a pretty hilly campus um, I mean we are literally built on a hill um, so it is a relatively hilly campus it can be challenging um, to navigate but the spaces itself are created with accessibility in mind so every building you go in has uh, uh, you know wheelchair accessible entries and you know uh very, very small steps for people who might not be able to go up a step that might be this big. So the buildings themselves are created with a lot of accessibility in mind. There's elevators everywhere. Um, but just physically, the, you know, the land that we're built on is rather hilly. It's important to note, though, that students who have physical needs in terms of navigating campus can use the accessible transportation system that we have on campus. So we have one, a trolley system that kind of just operates as this, um, you know, just loop system that goes around all day that students can jump on to get to and from campus. And then also, if you have a very, very particular schedule, you can reach out to our accommodations office or center of disability resources and actually get a shuttle that will come to your residence hall, bring you to the building you're supposed to be at, pick you up from that building, bring you back, and all that good stuff. So there's certainly a lot of accessibility measures put in place to overcome just the physical land that we're on. Okay, all right, great. I, I have a question. Okay. Uh, say, uh, you guys say um, two to three classes per student, but I personally want to take uh, one class. Will you make that accommodation? Yes, yes. Two to three is the average, but we have some students that only take one class a semester. Um, and that's that's totally fine. Just keep in mind, you know, I mentioned earlier, if you're taking two to three, you get a lot of opportunity to experiment to find your major. If you're only taking one class a semester and you're doing that for six semesters, then you've really got to know what you want to do right away, right? Because you're only going to take six classes before your internship year. So just keep that in mind, okay? Okay. Um, say, uh, say if I wanted to play on the baseball team, that would give me a credit too? Um, no, there's no credits for any of the, the club sports teams or anything like that. Like, um, that's an extracurricular. I, I, no, no, uh, do, do they, 
um, say if I wanted to play on like the university uh, team. Yeah, that would only be a, a club sports team. Uh, varsity sports are reserved for um, matriculated matriculated students, students um, that are going for a bachelor's degree. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I th thank you, sir. You're very welcome. Thank you. Sam, I think the next two questions are for you. Um, is there are any- they on the sheet? Yeah, take, yep. Okay, cool. Um, are there any majors a student can't take? No, there aren't. However, there are places that we haven't, you know, rocks we haven't turned over yet. So there are certain um, majors that we've never had a student take because we've never had a student say they want to do them. Um, but truly, that's like our main restriction is that there are just we haven't had access to it yet. But that doesn't mean we can't have access to it. I will say that we, we have a few majors at SU um, and we've seen this, you know, like I said, I've been here for a decade, I've seen the ebb and flow, but we do see programs ebb and flow of um, having a really hard time opening extra seats for our inclusive youth students because they're struggling to even get enough seats for their bachelor seeking students. So we do see that from time to time where a program that might have been a really viable option for students a year or two ago is going through a transition and we're having a hard time getting our students into classes. So I just want to, you know, while yes, all the doors are typically always open for us, occasionally we do run into problems where a certain program is going through a growing pain or a transition and it becomes more challenging for us to get our students into those classes. Um, but I would like to say that that's far and few between each, each year. And then um, is the certificate that students earn recognized in any sort of official way by employers or other academic uh, institution if students wanted to continue their studies? Um, <clears throat> I don't know if we have enough evidence on that to state strongly yes versus no. What I can tell you is that we have a really strong employment track record to prove that this certificate works and that it helps students get employment. Um, we, uh, we are sitting at almost every single student who's graduated from this program finding employment within six months of graduation. There are some exceptions to that. We've had some students that haven't chose to pursue employment afterwards, but we have very, very high um, successful employment numbers to prove that this cert does matter. But I think we all know that it's not the piece of paper that really matters. It's the experience that you get from being in a college program for four years. It's the maturity that grows from being in a school program for four years. It's the ability to show someone that you took that leap and that you made that effort that I think means more to most folks than any sort of certificate that you can show them. Um, so yeah, I think the, the growth that people, the growth that people experience here over four years is more important than any piece of paper we could give them. I will note that the certificate that a student receives is awarded by the university. It's not a made up credential. It is something that the university has created, um, and has used in the past that our students are currently using. So this is not a special certificate. It's not a made up certificate. It is a credential. Um, so that does hold meaning showing that the student completed their coursework and their time here at Syracuse University. Wow, that was a lot of really great questions. Um, and we appreciate everybody's patience as we work through all of those questions. Um, feel free to follow us on social media. We are on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I don't think we're on TikTok yet, um, but feel free to follow us on social media. If anyone has any other questions, oh, um, you can always email us at the Tayshop Center at syr.edu. Um, there's one last question in the chat. Uh, what's, a, what's the advantage of, of this certificate compared to getting an associate's degree? Um, I really think this is individualized to the student. Um, the student and their circle of support and their network really need to decide what is the best path for the student. Um, a lot of our students 
gain confidence and experience and knowledge by auditing their classes and earning the certificate. Um, and that's because they're able to modify their course curriculum um, and really dive into the course at that modified level, but really learn and understand from those adjustments. Other students may benefit from matriculating and completing an associate's degree. So um, I really think that's individualized to the student, um, but where our team, and I'm sure Sam is more than happy to talk to you about the details um, in a more personalized conversation. Awesome, so feel free to reach out to us. Um, and we're so excited you're all here and we hope to be talking to you all soon. Can I make one plug? Sure. Uh, for anybody who's visiting from the West Coast, we will be out in Colorado Springs. Um, on October 24th for an inclusive college fair. We also will be at a National Down Syndrome Congress's college fair this summer. So if any of you attend um, state of the art conference uh, or uh, NDSC, you can find us at both of those places this year, in addition to our on campus events. Great, great plug. Awesome. So thank you everybody for attending. Have a great evening. Thank you.